So we're here with Chuck Stroll, former Conservative MP, former Cabinet Minister. Chuck, you uh, came up with the Reform Party, you, you know, then transitioned to the Conservative Party. How would you describe, or, or what would you say, the, the sort of the Harper era of conservatism this last nine years has sort of accomplished for conservatism in Canada? Well, of course, uh, the Prime Minister came in, uh, he was as leader of the opposition then, but really came in uh, with the thought of uniting the conservative movement uh, in a political party, a federal political party, and has been tremendously successful on that. I mean, the, the party had gone through so much tumult uh, before that. It had been, um, you know, it spent, it been put in the penalty box because of that. It, it wasn't able to gather any uh, kind of significant momentum or, or uh, certainly achieve any political power. So, you know, his, his first as far as the movement's concerned, his first uh, achievement was to actually bring that together. And it was against all odds, and as you know at the time, it was against even a lot of the spoken um, commitments from, from people in all political parties that it would over, never happen over my dead body. But he was able to do that. It was actually his, kind of the first public example of his, of his strategic uh, thinking. It was really, you know, he had, he had a long-term view on it. He was convinced it had to happen, and, uh, and really it was, you know, it was his uh, uh, you know, the exercise of his office that actually made it happen. And, and since then, he's been in like Flint. <laughs> has, it, has it changed the discussion much? Because, you know, I think, you know, the Liberals had had such a long yeah. time in office, and the conservative, conservative parties, I guess, had had various chances, and it, it wasn't clear whether, you know, they could break through, whether they could become part of the conversation. And there'd also been, I think, you know, this, I think there was maybe even a little touch of, you know, within mainstream discussion, this sort of like, well, what is the Conservative Party? Yeah. You know, can they be trusted to govern? What will that be like? Do you think they've you know, the conversation has changed significantly? Are the Conservatives now a comfortably mainstream party in Canadian politics? Well, certainly they've broadened their appeal uh, since the, since my early involvement. You know, I mean, it, it was I when I started, it was a regional rump, if you will, and uh, you know, it was a Western-based party and with national aspirations. But it's been broadened since then to uh, you know a pan-Canadian party with inroads in kind of untraditional or non non-typical um, areas in, in the multicultural community and and so on. So they they have broadened their appeal and have made it more pan-Canadian and have uh, there's no doubt about their national aspirations. So it's a it's a it's a solid political movement. You know what what uh, you know what the caution always is is that there was. In the early days, when we kind of put this thing all together, put it all together, there was an awful lot of emphasis on the mechanics of doing that. You know, so there was the United Alternative, and there was renaming of parties, and you know, trying to uh, you know split the baby, so to speak, and, and uh, in a political sense of you know well, what can we all do a little of in order to make this all happen. And uh, and so what you you know, you know the, always the caution or the reason not even the caution the reason there's a something like the Manning center uh, conservative movement idea is that you know we want to make sure that the ideas that underpinned it all don't get lost in the sh in the political shuffle because it's it's extremely important to have the politics right internal politics and external communication uh, but that can't be what it's all about and you know in the end it's about doing something not just holding power and so uh, what this kind of a conference allows is for the a much more free exchange of ideas. So while others are worrying about, you know, how to how to uh, uh, raise ten million dollars for the upcoming campaign, we'll leave them with that, and we'll talk about ideas and concepts and international and other uh, things that are happening that you need to be aware of. In the, as a conservative, uh, don't lose sight of the fact that conservative principles and values are underpinning all of this. So it's not just an election machine but there's actually a reason for holding power. And you think those ideas have been furthered in the last nine years? Well, they have been. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. You always find purists that say, uh, you know, it's not enough of something. But, but it's, in a sense, you have to look back at where we were and, and where we are now. So, or, and, and or what would have happened if the other guys had been in power? Right. So, you know, my old portfolios, I think of things like, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, our, the position on the wheat board would not have changed if the conservatives hadn't been here. So they have a, a more a free market attitude toward both on trade, specific things like the wheat board and other other uh, uh, policies like that. Very specific, uh, an absolute commitment to reducing tax loads and so on. So there's a 
So those things are, are kind of threaded through it all. Uh, the reality is, of course, is that politics is also the art of the possible. Right. And uh, so sometimes you'll get purists, and I, I always like the purists. Uh, I like them beacon off now and again to make sure that we, we remember where the true North Star is. Uh, on the other hand, the political reality is that you, you know, you govern for, for all of Canada, not just for the, not just for the purist in the back room. So you, that's, that's also happened along the way, and it's necessary. Do you think Canada has changed? I think that's also true. I mean, uh, because it's it's almost just a demographic reality, and uh, and in part, I think that's helped the conservatives as well. And people are, uh, you know, the the country demographically is a different group, and that's why that's why they were smart, and and why it was, why I was so pleased that they made such an effort to reach out to them in a multicultural way. You know, so what was what was seen before as uh, you know, there's only one party you can vote for, the Liberal Party, if you believe in immigration or multiculturalism or whatever, uh, that dynamic has changed. So it's not like it's 100% conservative now, but at least it's a good balance of, as it should be, a balance of people and competing ideas right across the country and in, in all those sub-communities there. Uh, so that's been very good and very healthy for the movement, uh, where it would have died on the vine if it had stayed, uh, you know, stayed like a, a 1960s party. Do you think the Conservative Party can become, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the old idea was that the Liberals were the natural governing party right. of Canada, um, and they were very successful in the 20th century. Can the Conservatives be that new natural governing party, or, you know, maybe, maybe politics are, are even too volatile at this point, but, you know, can the Conservatives be that dominant, that dominant party going well, one forward? Of, one of the things we said in the, at the Manning Centre was, uh, uh, and as a broad objective, what if, what if, Instead of only holding office one out of three elections, you held office two out of three elections. You know, it's, you don't, you know, then realize you're not going to be there forever. But what if, on average, instead of always being in in the opposition, that you did your share of time across the aisle, and uh, you kind of set that as an objective. And I'm going to talk about that uh, here at the conference as well about the need to to think not just about the federal system, but uh, across the country at the provincial level uh, is you know some concern in some jurisdictions that that they are spending way too much time in opposition. You know, if, if it becomes a reality that this natural governing party mantra of the Liberals becomes a reality at the provincial level and you have three, four, five elections in a row with the same government, then, then don't be surprised if it heads on a direction that conservatives aren't comfortable with. So we have to break that. You know, you have to just say somewhere along the line, you have to say, uh, you know, everybody gets a turn in the democratic system, but. But if the other guys, uh, with a different set of values and principles than yourself, are holding sway most of the time in most jurisdictions, then you know you're not going to be happy with the outcome. That outcome is going to be different than than your vision and your principled view of what Canada and uh, the provinces might look like. Aside from sort of the speculation that always comes about when the prime minister will will step aside, you know, eventually he will not be the prime minister, whether that's next year or ten right. years from now. What happens to the Conservative Party then? Can it uh, can it hold together the fiscal Conservatives and the social Conservatives and, and all the disparate groups that it's brought together over the last nine years? Or are there still issues that are going to have to be worked out? You know, I think of abortion. I think of you know uh, now assisted suicide. Like, are there issues that could threaten to pull that coalition apart? Well, it's been it's certainly been strengthened by the by the strength of the party and the and the fact that they went through some ugly times. Uh, prior to uh, uh, Mr. Harper and Mr. McKay putting it together, and in, in the final uh, final word, it, they went through some such awful times that you know that is kind of burned into our DNA a bit right now. You know, you, so if you want to fight amongst yourselves, you can be sure you'll spend a good long time in opposition. So that's kind of people got to get that in the conservative movement. Uh, but one of the reasons for uh, the Manning Conference is to is to give a, a venue, if you will, for movement conservatives to be to come together and network and exchange ideas and kind of have a you know friendly to and fro uh, amongst long, mostly like-minded people without the without the friction of the political party like the political uh, leadership race specifically to your question so so my hope is that as time goes on that it'll serve a purpose uh, uh, not even a it's not even a uh, you know an outlet for for uh, pent, there's nothing pent up. It's just that over the long run, I think it will be very healthy if there's this kind of a conference instead of um, 
us versus them that a leadership race will bring. In fact, I think in the post-Harper world, whenever that might be, that this kind of a conference will be even more important because it, it's right now there's absolutely no that I know of, absolutely no pressure on Mr. Harper to step aside. He has his firm control, he has full support of the caucus and the party. So he's in a great position politically uh, that way. But, but for any new person that comes in, there'll be an us versus them. There'll be at least two, maybe 10 people that want the job. And the danger is that it splits the party and, uh, and it allows for that division to last way too long. I think this conference, uh, which you know, is becoming increasingly a go-to event for people of all different backgrounds. And my hope is that even in the, in the whatever down the road, even in the post-provincial uh, leadership race, for example, that there'll still be people here say, well, I didn't vote for you and I voted for the other person, but I'm here together with other conservatives, realizing that in the end, we're gonna have to pull together. Thanks, Rick. Okay.